We're back with Coach Noah Mazzoni for another week, talking about ball, looking at some games we've seen, and, and talking about the approach that teams take and things that we can work into what we do. So, Coach, it's great to have you back from Germany. I'm sure that was a great time for you. I know I enjoyed the last time we talked, but unfortunately last week with uh, just some bad connections, we couldn't make it happen. So good to have you back here again. Sorry about that, Keith, but, uh, you know, I had to make sure all the uh, all the uh, the beer houses in Germany were, were up and running. <laughs> job I have. Yeah, somebody's got to take care of that. It's a rough job, I know. We had an incredible weekend of games, some some really big games. We've we've got college football just constantly changing those rankings and of course had the upset of Alabama by Texas A and M. An incredible game between Texas and Oklahoma in the Red River Showdown. And then going into Sunday, some great NFL games and I know one of the things you and I talked about before we got going here was shot plays. And I know specifically I was I I saw three in the Browns game yesterday. And I know like two of them were blown coverages. Another one was a missed tackle. But what I saw from these teams is really trying to influence one side of the field so that the secondary on that side is occupied kind of on those intermediate routes. And they're not necessarily getting over the top of things. And and then bringing a guy all the way from the other side, either like on a deep crosser or on a post that just now has all kinds of space to run to because there's nobody else there to help. And I saw that twice with, with San Diego, with Cleveland, it was, it was their tight end coming across, crossing a crosser. And when he broke a tackle, there was no one left. So the thing though, that I see oftentimes, and I think the mistake that's made in creating these plays is that you see a lot of routes bleed into each other so that maybe you have that guy running that deep post, but another route is also running deep. And now that that guy maybe who's trying to midpoint something or playing over the top of that gets involved in that that other part of the play and, and takes away that shot. You know, it's funny you brought that up because that's kind of the thing that I've really seen here in the last year or so, a couple of years, is the shot plays. We've become such a, offensively, we've become such a horizontal offense. In other words, I mean, everybody, we're throwing the bubble screens, we're throwing the quick games and the slants and, and all those type of things. And, and I think we had this discussion before about, you know, how do you extend the ball vertically down the field where it's not be, where you're not just in four wide, you're calling, calling four verse. And uh, I, just off the top of my head, I can think of the Iowa game was decided on a, on a shot play, mm-hmm. like the little Don route by the tight end. I know the Oklahoma Texas game, numerous shot plays. Right. That one of the last drives Texas had, they threw the deep over for the touchdown. Gosh, I mean, like every game you're seeing this, and what I, what you're seeing is you're seeing like it amazes me is a lot of these shot plays are you know seven, sometimes eight man protection, and they're two and three man routes. And so I know one thing right now. If I was a young coach getting in this profession, I think I would lean to being an offensive, and not a defensive coach, because <laughs> the offenses are crazy right now. Yeah, I mean, on both the NFL and both the NFL in the, uh, I mean, you watched the Bills game last night and uh, Josh Allen, I mean, slinging them down there and hitting all those those big those big uh, explosive plays down the field. It's cool to watch what these guys are coming up with, as far as move the pocket. They're moving the launch point, right? Uh, they're getting like these deep overs, these deep double moves, uh, deep posts with with uh, deep meshes and all these kind of concepts going on, where it's basically just like three-man routes and everybody else is staying in protection. Texas, you're right. Texas had one. Their touchdown there at the end, uh, Xavier Worthy, who was you know, a freshman, just running all over him the whole game. And again, one of those situations created where he was just running that, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if it started as a post, if it was a deep crosser, but opposite of him on the other side of the field, just those intermediate routes that occupied the the defenders who, if you're just running something vertical, they're there as well. And now you've got a guy, fastest guy on the field probably, with all that field space. I mean, there's not many guys who, even if, if they're some of the best defensive backs, who are going to be able to stay with that, with all that space to defend. And I think you can create and work together some of those routes that, that work well to support that. So it's not just that one that you have some things to come down to if if it does get covered or something happens. Yeah, and usually what I've been seeing more and more guys doing, it's usually just a leak out by the uh, a leak out by a back or a tight end that's in the gap. You know, most of these things 
like I see the two main protections being in these shot plays is just they're they're just gap, you know they're faking the tight zone, where, where, you know where the tight ends in faking the tight zone and gapping it off, almost like a, you know we call it whiskey protection, gapping it off and then trying to you know give a little play action fake, try to try to hold the backers and create that space between the second level defenders and the third level defenders, and then and then basically throwing these deep overs and these deep comebacks and these deep uh, posts and all that, you know, in that, in that, between that second and third level uh, group of defenders. And then, you know, I think, you know, and every now and then they teach those backs or the tight end, if the, if his gap, if he doesn't have somebody in his gap or whatever, maybe he could leak out slow to the flat kind of as a check down deal, but see more and more of it. And then they're in, and I think the other thing they're doing a great, the guys, I mean, they're doing a great job of is formation in these plays. You know, out of bunches and out of tight, you know, uh, tight splits, and out of like uh, I know, like Sark likes to use the ghost motion. You know, the he, he uses a lot of motion to the field uh, with the receiver to you know kind of hold those flat defenders and those guys out there. So um, yeah, it's been. I'm gonna tell you, I mean, I, I spend I spend most of the week just kind of going back through watching the games on Exos. Go back and watch the, some of these teams just to kind of get ideas and to see how they're doing stuff. And it's been, they're very impressive. There's so much you can do. And I agree. The, uh, the offenses today have it a lot easier than those defensive coordinators. You brought up uh, the ghost motion. I, I really like that kind of motion and uh, something, you know, I, I utilized uh, one particular year. We got kind of banged up at the, uh, the running back position and a little bit thin there. And so we had to find ways to run the football and get the ball to you know one of our our better guys, and I think a, a way to do that certainly you could do it with some of the jet stuff. But I liked what we could do with that ghost motion, that guy going you know basically back to tailback depth, kind of becoming you know another back there where you end up with that old Tubby Raymond kind of philosophy where at, you know at one single point over the midline you've got three guys who end up going in different directions. You know, one out to the side on a sweep, the quarterback, the keeper away from that, and a guy right up the middle on some kind of, you know, could be an inside zone, a power, a counter. I've done it all those different ways. But it really starts to stress the defense. And, you know, I've seen this with us, and I've seen it over time, that teams that start to incorporate that slow down those safeties, those especially those teams who like to try to get those guys down quickly into the run game and create a nine in the box situation. And, and to me, it's a good way to be able to hold the defense, make you make them play you honestly. And again, for those guys inside, especially kind of clean up that box. It's funny. Cause I was just talking to a, a team this morning, uh, helping them with a, with a game plan. And so, and, and watching, you know, like how I, how like I, th- I look at it, which isn't right or wrong. Just how I do it is that, you know, the first thing when I want to break down a, you know, how am I going to attack a, a defense is, is I always start with the formations, mm-hmm. All right? So what, what formations give me the, the looks I want or give me the advantages I want? And then the second thing when I look at the formations is who are the two guys I have to beat? So, you know, you're playing a lot of these teams that they're, they're going to play, you know, five or six in the box, but they're always going to have an extra run fit guy, um, you know, like a four, like a free safety or a nickel or something like that that's, that's also going to be, a run fit into the in, into the front to help them on the run. So I'm always, you, you try to identify those who who are those guys, who are their run fit guys, who are they adding into the box for runs, and then that's how you, then that's how you start to build build your concepts and build like okay these are the two guys that I have to beat, All right? These are the two guys that I need to affect in my scheme, uh, whether we're, whether they're the RPO conflict read or I've got to get a blocker on them. Or however, or I got a formation that to get him to where he can't be the run fit guy, or do those type of things. And I think that's where just lining up in in base formations. Now, unless you're Iowa, right? Which was an awesome game, Iowa Penn State. Like like you like you said earlier, definitely a chess match between two really good coaches and two really good teams. Iowa lines up and they're going to do what they do, mm-hmm. and then they're going to wait for you to. Wait for you to fit the run, and they're going to throw the ball over the over your head. I think nowadays that the ability that I see so much more variations in formations, motions, stacks, bunches, 
you know, not necessarily a bunch of new schemes because the power is power. Tight zone is tight zone, right? But more so is building formations that that you feel give you advantage or put guys, leverage guys or put guys in conflict. The Iowa-Penn State game, I, I did think it was a just a chess match. Obviously, Penn State having to deal with the loss of their quarterback, and I thought uh, Mike Yersich was – you know, continuing to do some good things with that guy to, to create some things for him. And then I saw Iowa too at, at times, you know, they start the game, they're a little bit more spread look 11 personnel. And then they then they get into 22 personnel and they're running, you know, outside zone and some zone lead plays and, and then play action off of it. So it was again, just that back and forth and, and kind of came down to, who had the chalk last, but, you know, an incredible game by teams who did, I think, deserve to be ranked where they were. A hundred percent. I know you, I know Mike, I mean, he's always done, done a great job. Great, great scheme guys on his offenses. Don't, don't really know the Iowa, Iowa, you know, group that much or what they do offensively from what I've just seen on film, but you're exactly right. And it's, uh, it's just, it's just fun to watch these guys coach and these guys, uh, you know, game plan every week and, and all the, all the cool stuff that they're doing. So, Coach, last week we had uh, DJ Elliott on, and we were talking about some defensive things. I feel like a little bit of a traitor. Sorry, Coach, I was talking defense with somebody. But You are, you are a traitor. <laughs> traitor. <laughs> One of the things we were talking about is is the stemming front, right? And um, I really like how he referred to is is their – procedure for going on two on defense that you know you move that real quick you have the tendency to get some of those guys to false start especially if you're in a short yarded situation but I also know that especially for teams that rely on offensive line calls and you know you know getting the mic point you know in the right direction you know whoever you're you're calling the mic that uh, some of those things start to change things for them for for you how did you view those teams that would try to stem against you and, you know, what tools you, I guess, did you look for that maybe you could do some things to hurt them if they're trying to move like that? Yeah. And, and, and DJ's right. You know, the cheaters, they try <laughs> to move to get us to jump off sides. All right. Or they, you know, they have some call, all right. Um, you know, and, and, and when you have to worry, and this is just an offensive guy talking, I know I've never coached defense, but, what I, what I what I kind of see it as as you you got to you in some way have to disrupt the, the pattern of the scheme in the run game, and um, you know if you're not you know stunning linebackers or bringing fire zones or doing things like that you know run run stunts, right? Then you have then uh, it's kind of it's kind of a pain in the ass for offensive guys is when you start getting the line stunts, the twists, the spot, the pirates, uh, you know the 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 add on guy. Uh, you know the single dogs and things like that to just kind of disrupt your your pattern as a uh, you know your blocking pattern, uh, which is which is why back in the day why everybody went to zone blocking zone football you know zone zone concept football. So it's, so I think you see if you watch most offenses nowadays you're going to see basically either a, either zone zone type schemes or you're going to see some sort of a gap scheme. Because all the the man blocking stuff becomes more difficult, obviously with a with a with a D line that moves a lot. Mm-hmm. So it's it's an issue, and it's one that that offensively you got to you got to be aware of. You know, we used to think back in the day that back when we first started this ten years ago in the no huddle in the tempo stuff was the tempo eliminated a lot of that because they didn't have time to get all their lunch line stunt calls in and you know set the set the fronts right and. And the D line coaches over there giving his guys this, you know, they didn't have time to do that. But now they've kind of caught up to us on that piece of it and have automatics or, uh, you know, built in uh, tempo defenses uh, against different formations that, uh, that have that stuff built in just like we do. Coach, in looking at uh, some notes, uh, I was back to some notes I had on my phone from 2016, and I was at the Glazer Clinic in St. Louis. You were speaking there. And I know at the time, I think the concept I found, let me look right here, uh, was an attachment you were using with your H back, right? Uh, and you called it bolt. So basically the equivalent of a, a bubble to the tight end. But instead of running a bubble, he's running a flat route. And um, yes. I think 
when I look at those, and I have seen these run even with the, the receivers where they line up a little bit deeper and, and it looks like they're running a flat route, but they actually never get across the line. And I think in, in a lot of ways that, that stresses the defense a little bit different than it, they see that bubble guy right away, right? That they, they tend to attack that. But right. if you have guys running vertically and a guy running flat, you know, they're a little bit more in that pass defense kind of demeanor rather than I need to, you know, break up this, this uh, screen on the perimeter. So for you, those kinds of plays, how important are they to have just as part of your toolbox in attacking a defense? There's twofold. One is from what you just said, I think it's a different look to the defense because that's also the same look they're going to get on slant, flat, flat, or on curl, flat, or on, on three-level flood, you know, when they get a guy run to the flat and not as a screen player. Okay, not a guy that's that's running a screen like you're talking about with all the bubble stuff going on and guys coming off, coming off slow and, and trying to block. So I think, and, and and it's also, you know, also it gives you a chance to out leverage your defense. You know, like we always talk about. You know, what we're always trying to do is outnumber or out leverage the defense, and basically that's what bubble screens are. Bubble screens are just how you out leverage a defense. You know, if they don't, if you're out there and you're in spread sets two by two and the outside backers uh, haven't widened out far enough from the box for it, then you've out leveraged the will backer, then you should throw the, throw the screen out there to the, to the receiver. So it's just a way now to condense the box and give you some room, more room to out leverage the defense. And at a, with a tight end in the box, right? It's hard for him to bubble. It's hard for him to, to run that where it's a lot easier for just to run him like you would run on naked, right? Kind of, it's almost exactly like how he would run on, on a naked play. Right. But what you're trying to do is get them to, to move the safety in the box, to you know keep the backers in the box, and keep the defense condensed, and now gain leverage on them. And I agree. Those those do start to look like some of the other things you might do. I mean, running, you know, when you do have that guy compressed and a receiver outside of him running that stick combo with the flat. So now if you do see those guys try to start to attack and – and uh, disrupt that, that, you know, you just have that guy turn around and he gets the ball right there. So just a lot of things that you could do with it. And again, kind of packaging those things together, right? Not just having one answer within that look, but a couple things that give you the answer to all the what ifs that might come up. Right. And then I always look at offense, like, like if that's a base play for me, the bolt, as we call it. All right. So now how do I protect the bolt? So you, you always have to protect your plays. All right, so, um, you know, how do you protect lead draw if you're an I team? Well, with lead draw pass, okay, when the back or ISO, all right, with uh, ISO pass. How do you protect power with power pass? All right, so I always think that, that usually the game plan is that, that whatever you have is, as in your, in your arsenal, in your game plan, is that your plays, plays protect plays. All right, so if they're giving me this look or they're starting to play the – the bubble screens or they're starting to play that, then, then I got to show them the bubble screen and I have to make the corner and the safety of the nickel play me honest. So I've also got to have some other things built in there that looks the same. So, you know, offensively, it's kind of, it's kind of fun because we get it. That's what I always thought. We get to dictate, we get to dictate the formation. We get to dictate the motion and we get to dictate the snap count. So those are our advantages. So we should use our use those things to our advantage. Uh, we should, uh, you know, give them formations, give them motions, and give them, you know, change ups in your snap count, uh, because the defense doesn't tell us that, that they we get to do what we want right there. As you build your your schemes, it's always a game plan or a, an offensive game plan is it, it builds, all right. It builds off a foundation of this is who I am, all right. This is what you guys have to stop, okay. I may change the presentation of this play to, to you, but I'm not changing the scheme or the, or the concept. All right. And now how are you going to stop it? Are you going to spin the safeties? Are you going to bump the backers? Are you going to go man coverage? How are you going to stop it? What's my answer when I see that? Because changing gears a little bit and focusing on the, the two point play. And this is something that came up obviously with Arkansas. So would you have gone with it if you were Sam? Would you have gone or would you have kicked it? I, I liked I like the decision in that game, uh, you know, by them to to go for it. Um, I thought their quarterback was getting a lot of time. Um, now I 
I was a little surprised maybe at the call, and they, they went with a version of Bill Walsh's you know sprint sprint right option, right? Get a guy into the flat, get a whole bunch of traffic for everybody else, you know, to to, to uh, for that guy who's following him to run through. Yeah, actually, I thought I actually thought they had the sprint out with the shuffle underneath. Yeah, that you thought. Yeah, I. Yeah, where where he where he could where he could where he could have shoveled the back if the end played up the field or something. I, you know, I didn't really look. I just kind of what I thought at the moment. You want to tie it up? Me? Okay. So, like, believe me, I'm. I never would quit second guess anybody. All right. Uh, I mean, I mean, the job Sam's done at, at Arkansas is, um, is, I mean, they're oh, yeah. a freaking really good football team and done a great job. But just personally, me, all right, I want to keep playing as long as I can play. That's just me. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't want to, I don't want, I don't want it to, I don't want it to come down to one call. And there it comes down to one call. Now, a lot of games do come down to one call, but heck, we just scored or whatever. I'm the, I'm, the, I've never been, and I've had to do it before. All right, because the head coach decided he wanted to do it, but I've never been a guy who's like, "Hey, let's keep playing." All right, let's keep let's keep calling plays and let's let's keep playing this game as long as long as we we need to. Yeah, and that's I, just I, that's just this, that's just this old man. <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't second guess a call. I mean, I, I've I've done both of those, and to me, it was always a kind of a personnel thing and how I felt about matchups, but. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned the, the shovel pass, and that's what exactly I was getting to. So the Browns had to run a two-point conversion and, again, made it look like a, that sprint right option kind of play. And Baker just stops and underhand shovels it as he's running uh, to, uh, I think it was to Hooper, the tight end, right there for the two-point conversion. Very creative play with how they did it. Well, of course, I would not expect you to say anything other than how awesome it was because it was Cleveland. That's right. It was. It was. But, but <laughs> Kevin Stefanski, though, you, you know this and having watched him, just very creative, right? We talked about that earlier, that you're going to get some kind of gadget. He's awesome. He, he is awesome in how he's taken. He didn't come in there saying, okay, I'm an NFL coordinator and I run these NFL plays. All right. He came in, he looked at the people he had, looked at his personnel, looked at the type of quarterback he had, and he and, and built an offense around his personnel. Yeah. I mean, I think the guy's awesome. I love I love what that guy does. It's been fun to watch, that's for sure. As a fan, not very happy about the loss yesterday, but that was another just incredible game, a, a shootout. And going back though to those two point plays, coach, and and your plan for installing those and, and planning those and uh, I would love to hear your approach to that. I know that I had a certain approach, but how did you look at the two-point play as far as the the schemes you wanted to use, and when were those installed? How were you working them? Okay, this may sound a little crazy, but at the start of camp, I always installed, like early in camp, was my, uh, my base uh, goal line, passes right my my base goal line and my low my low red zone a goal line my low red zone and my two point plays so they went in like in within the first couple of days of camp so that they were worked on they were worked on all through camp right and then uh and then there would always be one um game plan two point play so so depending on how the game was going you know how how you felt or whatever my, I always knew I had a group of plays that my guys had run a million times, mm-hmm. you know, and they'd run it against very, you know, against various different looks during camp uh, that the that the defense had shown them and all that. And then there was a game plan play in there, so that's how. So, that, so we basically carried pretty much two or three, two or three of the same, the same two point plays through the whole season, and then had one that was built for game plan. I took a, a very similar approach, and if I found that we used we used up what we had planned, um, and we usually would prepare that those base looks down there, we certainly we could run our goal line package, but also some, I don't know if I call them gadget type plays, but things that were a little bit different, right, and and designed to right. you know, attack man coverage or whatever it might have been. Uh, what I would do is once I used one of those up, then we'd start working another one. Right. And, and we put that one on the yep. shelf for a little bit and, but always having, I guess, a set of those that were ready to go in a game. And 
I know there certainly were games where we used them all up, right? So, so the next time, and we, and we might use them as as you know, play from the two, not necessarily a a two point play, but just exactly. something to get it in there. So I I do think you have to have them ready. It's a goal line play. Yeah, it's a goal line play, right? Now I do see a lot of people kind of use those special. Uh, sets down there those gadget plays you know uh, I think the first time I saw the uh, what's now known as the Philly special was maybe Chad Morris running that as a two-point play Um, man I can't even remember who he was with at the time but your thoughts on I guess you know we're trying to go two yards we do see a lot of gadgets in this area thoughts on using gadget plays to get two yeah I think I think you're gonna have one or two in there do I want to use it do I want to use it as the one to win the game for me at the end, like it was the other day? I I don't know. I don't know if I'd be that comfortable. I always think of I always think, and I always remember here of, of the Bell Belichick deal about when the game's on the line, think players, not plays. Mm-hmm. And so I want I, I so I want to think, okay, so where can I put my Christian Kirk of the world? All right. Where, where can I – What kind? how can I create something where I've got my best opportunity to throw the ball to him or hand the ball to this guy or whatever it is. So I, I'm a little bit more, you know, with with, with everything on the line and all that, thinking, pers- thinking player, you know, maybe a fade route. Maybe putting your, you know, your Y, your big receiver, who's your best player, at a guy, Thomas Duarte at UCLA, who is a phenomenal guy. It may be put him in the, in the boundary as the X, and just so if I got the one on one coverage, I could put him the fade. Mm-hmm. You know, so a lot of times those type of plays are are yeah, they're, yeah. They're everybody, you know, we've all done the little gimmick, you know, double pitch pass, the Philly special, the all those kind of stuff. But I also went in there where I, I go, okay, how can I throw it to my best guy? Right, and you see all of it work. That's the beauty of our game. I mean. Thinking back to, yeah, boy, it was it was a bowl game. I think it was the Orange Bowl, maybe, but years ago, uh, when Boise State upset Oklahoma in, in a bowl game, right? And they had that they had that hook and ladder to score, and then they came right back with the Statue of Liberty on a two point play uh, in that game uh, for for the game winner, and it all works, right? That's that's the beauty of how we do things. You know, you can't second guess anybody. You you do what you do, and you prepare your team for it. And uh, and usually that that's going to put you in a situation you feel comfortable calling things. Well, Coach, uh, it's good to have you back in the U.S. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I apologize for last week. Every weekend, football gets better. I mean, it's like that was like the best weekend of football I've ever seen, and I thought that two weeks ago it was the best. Best. Now I didn't get to watch any games three weeks ago because a week ago, a week ago they don't show college football in Europe. By the way, it's, you can't find it. So uh, I, I didn't get to see any games, but uh, yeah, yeah, I think the game is like crowds are there. The fan, I mean, that Iowa, the shot of uh, those guys waving to the kids at the children's hospital at Iowa, the, from the from the blimp or whatever. I mean, that was just like 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 gave me goosebumps, brought tears to my eyes. It was so cool. Uh, but you see these these the fan the A and M fans were going nuts. I mean, hundred six thousand. So it's just cool to see that the that, that the college football fan is packing the stadiums and they're seeing great football. Coach, I look forward to doing this again next week and we'll talk again soon. Thanks, Keith. See you, buddy. Well, it was great to have Coach Mazzoni back on the show and look forward to talking ball with him the rest of the season here. Remember that tomorrow is our defensive side of the ball with longtime FBS coordinator DJ Elliott. So keep tuning in to everything we have to offer in season, of course. When we roll out of the season, we're going to have a lot of great content, new interviews, all kinds of stuff for you. So keep following what we're doing at coachingcoordinator.com and follow me on Twitter at Coach K Grabowski.